some of our new members from our new Next Stage membership program joined us early for a little tour of Pat's home studio. And we had a great time. For those of you who are interested in becoming supporting members of the Next Stage, check out our website. We've got information about that. It's $10 a month or $100 a year if you are not a, a City Lights Pass holder. If you are a City Lights Pass holder, it's seven a month and 70 a year. And all of the regular programming on the next stage continues to be free. So everyone can always watch it, watch the archive on our YouTube, but our members get some special perks like some pre-show experiences. You get a special email every week with behind the scenes stuff um, and you are automatically registered for Zoom programs. So Lizzie was our rock musical in 2017. And the interesting thing about that was that Pat and Melissa worked on it together. Pat designed the costumes for act one and Melissa designed the costumes for act two. And so they, it was a real team effort. Then we're gonna talk about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And that was a Melissa show, beautiful and dark. You can see she's got a top hat and a nice coat there. <laughs> and then the third show we'll talk about is the elephant man, which was designed by Pat. Uh, and that was a 2016 show. So for each show, I've got a little, uh, either a video or a slideshow of photos so that you can get a taste of it if you didn't get to see the show. So I'm gonna start off with Lizzie. And with Lizzie, I have our promo video that I made for the show. And so you'll get a taste of the music too, which that show was just, it was amazing. Lisa directed it, Lisa Millette, our artistic director. And I'm going to read off the page so I get all the creators. Lizzie was created by Stephen Cheslick de Meyer, Tim Maynard, and Alan Stevens Hewitt. And that was our summer show in 2017. And here is the preview video for Lizzie. My name is Lizzie Andrew Gordon. I am innocent. I leave it to my counsel to speak for me. music. Uh, can everybody yeah. hear that okay? Did that go through okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Using some newer technology. Uh, I just love that show. I love the 90s feel of the music. I love how they start out as these very sort of proper 1892 ladies in act one, and then they explode into rock stars in act two, which must have been just such a fantastic journey for the two of you. Pat and Melissa, tell us, uh, walk us through how that started out in the beginning that you two started working together. How did that happen that you were paired up and how did you work together to develop your concepts? Pat, I'll let you start. To, to <laughs> I know, big question. Let me start, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was act one, that makes sense. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we'd known each other and I, I, my background is not, not entirely, obviously I've done a lot of contemporary shows and non-Victorian. But I really love Victorian and I had a lot of experience in it. And the first act is very, um, with tweaking, it's more of a traditional Victorian take. And then it busts into this rock, rock and roll kind of look in the second act. And Melissa's very rock and roll. And I, <laughs> but uh, no, she is. She, she, she had much more of a sensibility than I would have, I think, on that level. And, um, I was unable actually to do the whole entire thing. And I think that that's how we started working together was I was not able to do the whole show, but I could, I said, yeah, well, I can do the first act and I'll get it all done early, which we did. And then Melissa came in and did the, the second act. So working together, I mean, we just communicated. We, we just, we, we communicate pretty well, I think. <laughs> So 
we talked a lot and shared ideas and um, basically I think it was sort of colors and ideas of, you know, yeah. Take it away, Melissa. What do you think? But I mean, so when um, I came into it, uh, Pat had already, for the most part, designed Act One. And so uh, for me, I had done research on the show myself. And so um, I had seen different productions do different interpretations of Act Two. And I had felt that there was a disconnect um, between those two acts, usually portrayed on stage. And usually Act Two was very like gas and rock and roll, just black fishnets, uh, revealing clothing. And the characters became ambiguous because you couldn't really tell who was who. Um, so for me, um, I really wanted to stay true to Pat's design. Um, so I took into consideration the colors um, and some of like the different elements of like simplicity and more ornate femininity. And so I try to take that idea and kind of take a different spin on it making it a little more steampunk instead of um, that rock and roll and goth so that we can play around with different types of skirts. I found some skirts that were fun to like pull up and down to show different parts of the leg. Um, I did more like Victorian type shirts that were um, obviously modern, but kind of had that Victorian feel. And then I remember with Lizzie, um, Pat designed a really beautiful corset um, belt um, that she wore in all of Act One and I just, we wanted to take that into act two and then I basically uh, dressed her around that. So I really wanted to keep those elements kind of true so that you could still tell who was who and they're still portraying themselves just a little more um, on it. Uh, what is it? A little more frantic, a little more chaotic and a little more yeah. fun. Reggie. Yeah. 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 And I should say too that um, <clears throat> of course, as you saw in the promo video, this is a show about Lizzie Borden and uh but the other characters, it's four women and there's Lizzie Borden, there's her sister, Emma, there's the next door neighbor, Alice, and there's the maid, Bridget, also known as Maggie. And I, that's one of the things I just, I loved is that you see their, their personalities showing through in the costumes. And, and, and as you said, Melissa, it's not just proper and the rock star, proper the rock star. It's like they're, they're, no. their characters are, are carrying through too. For, for those of us who haven't seen the show, um, can you tell us a little bit about those characters and how their personalities show, shown through in their costumes? Um, yeah, I mean, it was a sat, it was a kind of a status thing, obviously. Um, with, I always felt sort of Lizzie, you know, obviously at the center at the top. And then, uh, and then the, um, Maggie was uh, the maid. So she had a very traditional kind of maid. She had an apron on and sort of grays and drab, kind of very proper Victorian blouse in act one. Um, very, it wasn't a uniform, but it was borderline kind of, you could say, oh yeah, she looks like a maid. Mm -hmm. And then Alice was just the girl, the gorgeous girl next door. So she was just you know, look at her, fall in love with her, innocence, beautiful, golden. I, I have a real tendency, Lisa probably noticed, to put in, from two shows, to put the put to put the the femme fatale in gold. I just feel like golden girl. I mean, I, I just head towards a gold color, a golden color for that kind of a character. Um, it just is a shiny kind of uh, you know. So Alice was in light yellow flowery top and a gold skirt, uh, you know, linen, but a gold skirt, not satin, but a gold skirt. So, so there's a status thing that you, you know, kind of, um, and Emma was very kind of buttoned up. She was, you know, had the very Victorian kind of buttoned up top, but in act, but that was, yeah. <laughs> you have to look at it that way. You have to kind of try to get into everybody's head and you know and, and then you know loosen up obviously because Lizzie had to have a dress that uh, it had to be blue because that was in the script it had to be a blue dress it's mentioned the color and it had she had to take be able to take it off quickly so on stage I think it was on stage or it, it yeah. came back on yeah so you have to also look at it with those kind of constraints like okay it cannot be a Victorian like this, this two-piece dress here um, from Elephant Man would be called a dress, even though it's two pieces. 
So Lizzie in the Victorian times, the dress would be would have been two pieces, but they would have called it a dress. But you have to bend that for theater because we're doing theater. We're not doing historical anachronism. So, you know, you, you have to figure out some way, other way to, to do it. So it became a dress, what they would call a wrapper, a one piece, one piece dress, which is shapeless. And thus the corset belt corslet came on because, you know, it's, you need to make them look pretty too, so. <laughs> do you have a drawing of that one, Pat? I know you said you had some Lizzie drawings I in front of you. do, I do, let me see here. This is, um, that's yeah. the original. The puff sleeves went away, but um, that's pretty much the way it was. And then I do have one, this was the original, was the original thing that I was I was thinking of as a change and then we realized she couldn't change so that got done away with and then I think I did that that drawing which is the same kind of forgive the wrinkles it's watercolor on not watercolor paper so <laughs> beautiful so yeah um and then oh and then the and then this was Alice, which the original drawing, which you can tell is very kind of flouncy and feminine. Well, and she had the red, kind of golden red hair too. So it was kind of all she was blonde, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> strawberry, strawberry blondish. Yeah, of. yeah. And then this was act one. I, I did a little, little something. I can't remember what we did, but somehow her apron was bloody and then not bloody. So after the pigeon <laughs> yeah there was there was death. some blood in that show i must Love say that. created Love by that. miranda who's here in the room <laughs> there was some blood <laughs> and melissa you have as one of the things that i learned when i interviewed the creators of the show and who were kind enough to let us use some snippets of their music for publicity purposes which is is wonderful we don't usually get that for a musical the music is very 90s it's very um it's almost a little grungy. It's a, there's there's so much to it. Were you influenced most by the sound of the music as well? Um, I I was really influenced by the music, uh, not so much in the design. I think I was influenced with like the hair choice. I think I felt like I wanted um, the hair in Act Two to be a little wild, a little not quite punk, but a little grungy, a little bit teased. And so I kind of took that interpretation with the '90s with more of the hair selection, since I wanted the costumes to be a little more steampunk because steampunk is steampunk is still a little bit victorian but just a little edgier mm -hmm. so yeah mostly with the hair choice and i think um some of the makeup because i think we use like darker lips um definitely a little bit more um eyeliner so it was definitely not goth because it wasn't like black but it was um just like the neutral tones of 90s which is like kind of darker maroon and like brown mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. had either of you seen this show before before you worked on it no no yeah, it's not super commonly done, and a lot of our audiences hadn't seen it either. And so, it I guess you have a, some freedom there. <laughs> it's I don't know. There's a couple of schools of thought on when you costume something, whether you should or at work on a show at all in any kind of design or acting capacity, whether you should actually refer back to things or not. I mean, technically, you should start from scratch, and it should be you know. Um, I I will admit that I look at things and use them as reference. Okay. Yeah. And you could kind of look at it, like you said, um, Melissa, you looked at it and went, well, that's not what I would do. That's not right. So, you know, it can inform you that way to look at things too. So, yeah. Pat, did you look at any historical photos? I, obviously they're photos of Lizzie Borden, but you can find I, other things the other people. For this, for this, I did not. Um, for a lot of Victorian, I, I do check, like, but, this was looser. In other words, they, none of them had corsets on. And in a truly Victorian um, show, they, and believe me, I've put women in corsets a whole lot. <laughs> um, they would have corsets on, uh, but they didn't in this one because they needed to move and they needed to, um, it needed to be a little bit more modern and less const constricted in act one, even, but give a, the Victorian, you know, feel in act one so yeah 
So no, I didn't. I didn't look at anything. I. I mean, I did look at a picture, a drawing. There's one drawing of Lizzie Borden in the in the courtroom, yeah. and she had on what you would think, which was a two piece, you know, like a Victorian outfit. It was so th it wasn't really very helpful. <laughs> so <laughs> great. And had the two of you worked together before? Because you obviously you got you got great chemistry. You worked together. Well. <laughs> Not before, but we no. have worked since. <laughs> yeah, we have worked since. And hopefully again, because I love it. I think yeah. it's really, it's really fun to collaborate with someone, especially someone you get really along with and have the same sensibilities. It's really, it's really quite fun. So what, do, what else have you worked on together? We did um, a Doll's House Part 2 for well, no, 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 let's be fair. You just okay. designed it. I was her stitcher. So okay. that was it. I sewed the clothes and we went fabric shopping and kind of commiserated on that. But the designs were yeah. all 100% Melissa's designs. So we're not, I did not, I was not, it was not a co-design show. It was her design. Um, yeah, it's definitely um, what I, when I reach out to Pat, like I always call her my mentor, even though she might not like me saying that. But for me, it's um, as a newer designer, I always look to designers that actually make things from scratch to really um, get a sense of how things should look, how things should be. Um, if I'm attempting to like put something on like an already constructed garment, I kind of always kind of reach out to Pat. And I think with her and I, we just um, communicate really well and we want to stay true to um, the piece and obviously want to be historically accurate if we have to. And so I feel like when you have those same standards, it's easier to collaborate. Yeah. And we're really dangerous in a fabric store. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are really dangerous. We like expensive fabrics. <laughs> we like expensive fabrics. And, and, but we also had, we also, also seem to go to something and go, what about this? Nah, what about this? Yeah. Nah, it's not right. We all, we had for the same things a lot of times, which is really great. And I, and, and on, on Doll's House, I, I so loved being her worker bee. It was just <laughs> wonderful. I loved it. It was like, make this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure for sure. <laughs> oh, that's nice. What are your particular fabric guilty pleasures? You said you're dangerous in a fabric store. Oh, God, the expensive. We just head for the $25 a yard stuff. Always. <laughs> Silks, uh, really embroidered, like just beautifully embroidered fabrics that... Again, 25 and up. It's just like, yeah. but why? Because it's pretty. Oh, I love it. <laughs> well, Maybe thank we you. For half a yard. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're going to, yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for telling us about Lizzie. I uh, let's move on to, to Jekyll right now. Um, and okay. anyone, feel free you if you if you want to type questions in the chat, you can. And, and if they if they sort of come up during the show, I'll ask them, or we can all ask them at the end. So up to you. So Lizzie was 2017. We'll go back in time a little bit to 2015. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was the fall 2015 show. It was by Jeffrey Hatcher and directed by Mark Anderson Phillips. Wonderful Mark Anderson Phillips. This is a really interesting telling of Jekyll and Hyde because it has four Hydes. So you've got four villains and one of them is a woman. And, and it just gives a whole different dimension to the story. So here is a slideshow that shows you some of Melissa's gorgeous creations for this show. A little creepy. <laughs> a little. We've got a, I've got a bunch of creepiness tonight, but okay, it's close to Halloween. <laughs> murder, lots of yeah, murder. We've got, yeah, we've got yeah, parental murder and uh, yeah. goodness, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but as I said, that this Jekyll and Hyde, we've got the four villains, we've got the four Hydes, we have the Doctor Jekyll, and we have the girl who was who was just wonderful. 
Melissa, tell us about approaching a show with four villains and, and four villains who are all kind of different aspects of each other. So they're very much related. Tell us about the, the journey of creating those costumes. So um, I worked really close with um, director um, Mark Anderson Phillips, who um, I really wanted to get his vision of what he was wanting to see on stage, especially with um, all the hides. And so um, his, his version was basically these characters are hides, but they also play different characters in the show. So the costumes couldn't really be too elaborate because they had to switch back and forth between certain characters. And so we really had to come up with something that could work across the board that we would just have to do minimal changes. And so for creating the Hyde look, um, because the show was already gonna be so dark with the set being really dark and black, um, I really didn't wanna do the typical bad guy look with just mostly black and you know, splashes of color. So I um, kind of came up with them with this little, lovely little uniform back here. Um, of doing the top, uh, the top hat, obviously, for all of the hides. Um, the gray frock coat, which I thought would be a nice representation of light and dark, of, you know, Dr. Jekyll being, you know, the good character and Hyde being his dark black side. So it's kind of like a mesh of that creating gray. Um, and then I wanted um, to do the black waistcoat with red embroidery. So it was just a touch of red that was kind of popping and out. And so that was basically the Hyde uniform. So it was really up to the actual actors to really bring their own version of Hyde to the stage. They all had to kind of look the same, but they brought something new with their acting. So we had a, a really angry, aggressive Hyde. We had a more feminine Hyde. We had um, sexy Hyde and more of a crazy Hyde. So they all kind of played a little different, which was really fun. Um, I didn't have to go through a bunch of canes because I think that was one of the wonderful um, directing choices was that when you actually saw different hides together, they would pass the cane to each other to kind of symbolize the changing of the hides. So it was a nice, I was, it was nice because I didn't have to find all four matching um, canes, but it was also a nice visual for the audience to kind of see when they changed and how they kind of did it um, on stage. Yeah. Sorry, muted. I had forgotten about that that um that really cool directing choice because the actors who played Hyde, they went, yeah, yeah, Anne says in the chat, I forgot about that. It was kind of like a passing the baton. Because yeah. act, the actors would play different roles and then kind of become Hyde. Like I think there was one moment where they all sort of looked up and they all had the evil smile on their yeah. face, like all four of yeah. them at the same time. And I remember, remember that, Anne? I got, yeah. I got chills. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> just thinking about it. And then yeah, so that was a wonderful thing the about them being on stage together. It's like they had to look the same because during those moments where all of them were lined up, you couldn't have, you know, them looking different. They had to be all similar. Um, and that was one of the wonderful moments where it's like, if you do a very um, a very identical look, it just has more impact on the stage. Mm -hmm. Well, that was one of my questions originally was like, how many top hats and canes did you go through? And I remember it wasn't that many, but you had a lot of hats. <laughs> yes, so the hats are really important because they all, like again, when they were all lined up, they all had to have top hats. So I basically went to every single theater that I could find a top hat <laughs> at and try to rent those because all actors have different sizes. And again, they couldn't really switch off because they all had to wear it at once during a scene. Um, and like I said, I got lucky with the cane. Um, and <laughs> with the other characters, the ones that were playing multiple characters, that we did have to make some choices with hats, with different ties, with different waistcoats, so that um, we could really differentiate some of the characters that really needed to look different. But the base costume was the same. And what's this beautiful fabric that I'm seeing under the coat? It's kind of a wine color, which actually Pat is wearing. So Pat wore the same color just to coordinate with Melissa. <laughs> That's kind of hard to see, but um, basically it's a, a black waistcoat with a, a red vine floral embroidery. Mm. And so it's not fully red, so it's still dark, but it still has that lovely pop of red that just kind of peeks through. So. Uh, whenever an actor was playing high, they would unbutton the frock coat and you would see the vest more so that you can tell that they're high at that point. Yeah, as you said, a very dark show with colors, but then there were these other colors that popped through. 
And then I also remember all the different bottles and lighting in Jekyll's mm. lab, which yeah. is also a lot of that courtesy of Miranda Whipple, who's here on this call. <laughs> I'm just going to give everyone credit where credit's due. <laughs> Definitely. That was yeah. a wonderful thing with props. It would really pop a lot of different scenes that were so darkly lit and for, you know, the set being so dark that, you know, you really did need those pops of color just to help create some, uh, some differences on stage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, Kendall, uh, I forgot her role. I think it was Emma. Was it the name? The, yes. The name? Yeah, Emma. Didn't she? And the parasol. She's got the parasol yes. with that orange like that. Yeah. That's a stunning photo. That really was a beautiful touch. That was actually uh, Mark because he, I believe he has like a few of his own pieces that he wanted to bring into the show just to add color to it. So he happened to have that parasol and I was like, oh my God, yes, that would be wonderful because that scene is so, um, again, she was also dressed in more of like a gray and black and a little bit more muted so that those pops when they came, it was just like really striking. Oh yeah, really beautiful. And this was your first show design as a costume designer at City Lights, wasn't it? Yeah, second. Oh, second. Second. Yeah. Oh, West Side so, Story. Of course. Yeah. West Side Story was the first. Right, right, right. Yeah. Melissa, yeah. tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about your background as a costume designer before you came here. So I'm super new. So basically, um, when I I didn't even apply or anything, I basically sent out an email to Ron and I said, Hey, um, I had just come back from LA for uh, I lived there for a little bit and I came back and I said, Hey, um, I'm really new to, you know, San Jose um, theater. And I wanted to have an opportunity to work backstage as a dresser or a wardrobe and just kind of get my foot in the door because I really didn't have any experience. I hadn't worked with any theaters. And uh, during that time, because somebody, I think the original designer for West Side Story dropped out and they had already been weeks into rehearsal. And uh, Ron was like, well, you have a back, I had put that I had a background in uh, costume design. He said, do you want to do this show? And I said, ah, uh, I was really hesitant because it was a really huge show. And the only show I had done before was one uh, for my senior, uh, my senior show at uh, San Francisco State. And then one right after, which was for Teatro Vision. So I really had not worked with a huge cast. Um, I was really, really new and it was weeks into it. So I didn't really have a lot of time to prepare. So I said no for a while. And then finally I said yes. And then <laughs> the other person that was doing Jekyll and Hyde had to drop out. And he's like, do you want to just do another show? And I said, um, okay. So I, um, because it was a smaller <laughs> cast, I felt a little bit better that it wasn't as another, you know, 18 person show. So. That's how he grabs me. <laughs> Sometimes you're in the right place at the right time and it all comes yeah. together. Well, lucky yeah, for us. <laughs> <laughs> lucky for us. Pat, tell us a little bit about your background too. I realized I didn't ask you. Oh, it's mainly art. I, I was an art major and theater minor in college. And I really didn't, I mean, I knew how to sew and such, but I didn't really do a lot of costume design um, because I was, I'm an actor as well, and um, when we lived in LA, that's what I was trying to concentrate on, <laughs> was acting in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. Um, plus, you know, we moved from Seattle to LA, and then I got pregnant and had two children in LA, which really puts a, the brakes on your acting career really quickly. So then we moved up here, and I just frankly started again kind of sewing for my kids theater you know and if you can sew for 80 kids in the monkey king you kind of go yeah whatever so then I sort of started getting into I had done some costuming in Seattle um, with a theater company that I worked in but then I sort of started getting back into it again and the, the first real job job I had I think in a theater here was oh my gosh at least 20 years ago or more for um, Lyric Theater of San Jose. And so that's how I really got into the um, Victorian. Just sort of dove headfirst into Victorian and loved it so much. Loved researching it and loved constructing it, loved making it and just everything. So that, that's, that was my, yeah. And then, you know, costumers are in demand. So it's not like, you know, it's not, it's not like being an actor. I gotta say, <laughs> if you wanna be a costume designer and you are responsible and you're good and you get your work done, 
and you cooperate and people like you, you're, you know, you will work. It's, you know, I mean, you have to be good, but what I'm saying is it's not, it's not like um, there's a million people out there knocking down theater stores to be costume designers. So, um, so yeah, so that's how. And then City of Lyric Theater fans here in the chat. I just noticed <laughs> Kathleen and Elizabeth saying, yay, Lyric Theater. Yeah, <laughs> I can't even remember the first show I designed. I started in doing props at City Lights, I think. Yeah, because I was doing props at um, Palo Alto Players and then just kind of segued into uh, costume design there as well. I can't remember the first show I designed at City Lights at all. It's been a lot of them. <laughs> Well, the most recent one was Eurydice, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But well, again, lucky us, lucky us that we got <laughs> both of you working for City Lights from time to time. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at all these Lyric Theater fans in the chat. Ah, nice, yeah. Lyric yeah. Theater alum, yay. Yeah, I, should, I just had nine shows, I think, for Lyric, so. Nice, nice. That's great, and, the, the, and I have to say, because of this dang pandemic, Ding nimic pandemic um, that I did not get to make um, Miss Lisa Millet a corset for and put her in lovely Victorian wear for or no someday someday okay. this is just intermission that That's was all. for um, uh, Little Foxes that was yeah pretty. yeah yeah we had a lot of shows planned for this season that well yeah yeah oh well we won't anyway we'll, we'll think that yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. That was Pat, fun. You can still make one for me, Pat. But That's now true. I, 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 I would. I just want to lose my COVID nineteen first. Oh, tell me about and it. And then we'll get right on it. <laughs> I baked my way through the first two months and ate everything. <laughs> it's like a freshman fifteen, but the COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen. Oh yeah. Give me a minute. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh that was fun all right well let's, let's yeah, no, no, i owe you one i owe you one it's on it's yours whenever you want it yeah <laughs> to me too okay anyway <laughs> let's not digress too much all right uh what are we up to elephant man the elephant let's man. talk about elephant man speaking I, of yeah speaking i did make them more corsets for elephant man. <laughs> you did you did oh, no. So that was our production in 2016, The Elephant Man by Bernard Pomerantz, also directed by Ms. Lisa Millette in her spare time. Somehow she managed to do that too. Uh, let's run the slideshow for this one so you can see some of these gorgeous Pat costumes. And then after that, she's got one right next to her. You'll get to see that Golden Girl dress. But here's the video. <laughs> Yay. 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 And that, of course, also music and sound design by George Saras, who played Merrick as well. <laughs> oh, I think Lisa's getting a little emotional about that one. Oh, yeah. me too. It was I a very special show. show. Pat, tell us a little bit about, I I, did you know the story of, of John Merrick? Were you familiar I with did. it? I did. I did. I did know a lot about it. And of course, I'd seen the movie a million times. So I never, I don't think I'd ever seen the stage play i know they did it at theater works but i did not see it um but i did know the story and i did know about him and this story of john merrick and and again the 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 movie the the wonderful black and white movie um so i did know it and i did know that there's the um you know that the there is some status issues in that as well um but there i don't know there yeah, she just the the main character. I can't remember her name. This is Kendall. Can't is it? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Kristen Brownstone. <laughs> that she <laughs> just had to look 
like I mean she walks into his life and and makes him feel like a man and so she has to look like this amazing wealthy very well you know put out like decked out woman so that was where that was where the silks <laughs> that's where the silks came in um and there's something about putting a corset on an actor that especially in a victorian play that is so tr true to the victorian era like elephant man was lizzie not so much because it was a hybrid but the, if you put a corset on as an actress in a victorian play you hold yourself differently you you comport yourself in a different way. Um, women, if they dr drop something, they didn't pick it up, men picked it up. In actually true Victorian construction, women could not raise their arms above their elbow, above their shoulder. Um, so you couldn't go like that in a Victorian dress. So all that stuff makes you, f adds to how you feel about the character and your status within the play and all that. So yeah, they did They did have corsets. But then there was the one scene in the gold dress where she gets undressed and um, the corset was, again, this is a case where we're not doing historic anachronism, we we're doing theater. The corset was hard for her to deal with because corsets go down below the, the waistband of clothing. And she had to take the corset off on stage but leave the skirt and petticoats on so we had to make a I had to make a, a, a waist a kind of fudget and make a, a corset that stopped at the waist. And I don't think anybody noticed. I mean, I don't think anybody went, oh my God, that's not a wrong car. You couldn't tell. And of course, Kristen's so wonderful an actress that she just, you know, made it work completely. But um, yeah, and that's another case where the hero was in gold because she just needed to be the golden girl again. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then Lisa, of course, let me make it a whole entire play about a course about a lobster bustle because that was, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, and, tell us about the lobster bustle and show us that gold dress that's right next to you. Oh. So, yeah, this was. Um, you can see the that, and from the side, you can see how much it goes out. I mean, there are certain periods of. Victor Victorian, the Victorian era goes from 1850 to 1900. So it's a huge long period. So you can't just say Victorian, you have to kind of be specific. And this is from the late bustle period. So it was when bustles made a comeback. Um, and so they had this, and it, it just emphasized a small waist and a great big back, you know, backside. So underneath here is, I don't know if I can put this. I don't think I can hang it up. Um, underneath is the is the lobster bustle holding out this skirt, and when they sat down, it just folded up. Um, unfortunately, I can't quite maneuver. I have I don't have enough hands to take it all apart. But um, so and this had to actually have buttons on it because she took this off on stage um, and had to unbutton it. Generally, I would not put buttons on a even on a Victorian, there would be other closures. There would be hooks or snaps or something else, just because it's more of a, because it's a costume, not a garment. But this, she had to actually unbutton the buttons, so. Yeah. <laughs> How long did it take to make this dress? This one in the you beautiful know, red one we saw in the video. I don't, I don't like write down how long, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't pay attention to that. I just work on it. Some things go. Sometimes it goes faster than others. Um, <laughs> I just we. You know, you, if you did that, I think as a costumer, you'd start realizing how much you were making an hour. And you, <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> so okay, well, maybe we don't. We don't go down that road. Yeah, <laughs> well, you said in the beginning that you like to to create so many things from from scratch, and yeah. so I, we'll just imagine the hours. Yeah, I, it's you know, I mean, I, the de, the designing and the, the fabric. I mean, it's it's more it more of the picking out the fabric, picking out the design, all of that to put put something together. To sew something together doesn't take that long once you get it all cut out. I can make a, a bodice in a day, but you have to you know, get it all prepped first. It's like painting a room, you know, you've got to sand it and you've got to 
put tape up and everything like that, all the prep work. And then it doesn't take that long to actually paint it, but that's the same thing with a uh, costume, so. Mm. Gorgeous. And you talk about how corsets, how people hold themselves. Obviously, yeah. Eric carried himself in a very distinctive way. And how did that affect creating his costume? Was it? It, um, I, to tell you the honest God truth, I don't know if it ever did in my head, to tell you the truth. I, did, I never kind of came at it like, oh, he's got to move like that. I think the vest was probably a little looser than it would have been if it was, um, you know, fitted properly. Um, but uh, he was in, uh, you know, Victorian reproduction pants that I got from um, uh, our wonderful historical emporium, which is right down in San Jose that has Victorian clothing for sale. And um, I don't, and he, he was never in a suit. He was always in a shirt and a vest and pants. So he was pretty comfy if he wasn't in his nightgown or his skivvies, so. Right, I guess you can move pretty well in the, the yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a good point that you make about the, the corset and that's something that an actor feels. I mean, I'm an actor as well. And I always know yeah. that, that once you put either like something like a corset or you put the shoes on, you start yeah. to carry yourself differently and you really feel like the character. That just fits in such an important step in the rehearsal process. Yeah. And actually for a costumer, and also uh, you know this, I mean, the shoes are the first thing you want people to wear, either the shoes that they're going to wear or very close to the shoes that they're going to wear. And you want them to wear them in rehearsal because it makes a big, huge difference. And rehearsal skirts, for those of you who don't do theater, <laughs> we, when, when you're doing a period show, you, you spend a lot of time in rehearsal, you might be wearing like a City Lights t-shirt, but you're wearing a big old skirt because you do yeah. in the skirt. <laughs> Well, Pat, obviously you love Victorian costumes. You so do. either, both of you, Melissa and Pat, what are some of your other favorite eras to design? Uh, for me, it's um, 1920s. I'm a really big fan of the 20s, um, just because uh, it's just an aesthetic that I've just always been drawn to um, a lot of my life. That Victorian and 1960s, which I've never done the show in the 1960s. There's not that many, um, but those are the ones that, um, I find the most challenging because obviously they were geared towards a specific body type. And so obviously now in today's time, everybody's different and you have to uh, ultimately make them look good and feel comfortable and feel, um, feel empowered to be their character. So I always find those are fun challenges for me as a designer to, you know, take those time periods and bring it into modern times and make the actor just feel like they belong in that period. So those are, my two favorites. I like it. Well, I mean, I, I love like George, the Georgian, like Amadeus was, but I mean, everything, if you, like when I did um, Merchant um, at City Lights, we just, it was contemporary, but it was future, futuristic. Con con <laughs> Kit, love him dearly. I said, he said, how about 20 years in the future? I'm like, 20? 20 years in the future, what, isn't that like now? I mean, what is, how different is that? <laughs> so we'd have to kind of, we had to kind of go with some just little tweaks of things and color. Mainly I went for color in that. Um, yeah. And and that was contemporary with the twist. I, I guess the thing that I don't, I, I enjoy the least, although I enjoy costuming is just a really straight contemporary show because shopping and I'm not that fun <laughs> shopping. <laughs> Um, and those are I'm, usually the shows I do, so it's, it's, it's fine, Pat. I'll take those. I'll take. Those. I know. I was thinking yeah. Melissa in the Heights, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah oh, and Pat. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun I, talking I, about I, the I reading. Did, I did in the Heights at. Uh, I did in the Heights at Players, and that was shopping. Right. I went to Forever Twenty One, and mm -hmm. like. <laughs> Oh, and Pat, you and I had a lot of fun talking about Regency clothes when you did Miss Bennett Christmas at Pemberley at City Lights. Oh, yeah, Regency. Yeah, yeah. I made 11 dresses for that one. Holy, <laughs> wow. They're not that, they're pretty simple though. But um, yeah, and Regency is another, like um, Melissa was saying, body type. We Our bodies have changed over the years. And it's, you know, it's not, it's, there were certain silhouettes in certain time periods like the 20s and Regency that were meant for a certain body type that was that they had they were underfed they were like had no protein and they were not you know 
particularly healthy that way. And so it's a different body type altogether. And so you have to make people look good. So the challenge is to, you know, shift that into being, being a contemporary look um, mm -hmm. and still look good. Because the twenties is the same. It's all drop waist straight. It's like a sack. You know? Yeah, yeah. Adele asks in the chat, what are some of the most interesting aspects of 1920s clothing? That was the first yeah. thing. Yeah. The shape on the hats too, right? Those kind hats of, are beautiful. Uh, flower yeah. pot hats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love the 20s just because a lot of the intricacy and like the bead work and a lot of just mm -hmm. feathers and embellishments are just really make a garment very uh, alive, especially on stage, especially if there's movement involved. It just makes it fun to look at. That's nice. Well, we're going to open this up to general questions from everyone. Um, there's one more in the chat that, that I hadn't asked. Is Christine wanted to know what your favorite fabric stores are? Mm. Well, uh, I mean, Fabrics or Us is always good. <laughs> fabrics are, I mean, the go to around here is Fabrics or Us, which is this um, well, it's two stores now. It used to be three. Now they're down to two stores full of fabric down in San Jose. And it's not. It's not like Joanne's where it's all little, it's all big bolts of fabric and there's no prices on, well, there's prices on them, but they're kind of, you know. So if you go in there and you buy enough yardage, like I made friends with one of the women there. And if you go, if you buy enough yardage, um, like one time I was with her and I said, this woman came up and next to her and said, how much is this? And she looked at her and she said, $5 a yard. And then she looked at me and went, four. <laughs> so, <laughs> So if you go there enough, you can make, build a, you know, kind of a rapport, with, <laughs> but they walk around with yardsticks and they just pull it off. And, and then we found a great one that was in San, in uh, San Francisco, South San Francisco. Discount, or, right? Is that yeah. Yes, discount. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of beautiful, like silks and more embroidered fabrics. Yeah. Obviously bigger price tags, but. Leather, really. lots of leather. And leather. leather. Yeah, that's right. Um, but everybody keep their fingers crossed for Fabrics or Us in the fabric stores during this time because if those go, I don't know what customers are going to do around here because Joann's is closing too. Jo they closed one in Mountain View. That, that store's closed. Um, so, you know, we're all going to have to go down to LA with empty suitcases for the day because yeah. it's going to be very difficult to get fabric up here. You know, speaking of beautiful fabric, I forgot that I wanted to show a still photo of one of Melissa's costumes from Lizzie at the very end of the show. Uh, oh. <laughs> women come out in these incredible costumes. And I never made these photos public because I always thought it would be kind of a spoiler. So I just wanted to show you this, this photo of their <laughs> wings because they were so gorgeous. Tell us about these costumes, Melissa. So for the end of the act two, obviously the finale um, with Lisa, I think we wanted to really make it a very rock concert type feel to it. And for me, um, whenever I think of like, uh, not a girl group per se, but whenever, you know, you have like women on stage singing, I just wanted it to be, um, I wanted it to be seamless. So I wanted it to kind of all look the same because I thought it was just kind of really powerful, especially all in white, especially after so much blood and carnage and everything, um, just to kind of wipe the slate clean with white. I thought it would be really powerful to look at. And um, I had found these, um, they're mostly for dancing, but there's these like um, pleated um, kind of wing fabrics that looked really gorgeous under lights. They were iridescent and, um, I kind of wanted to have that effect so that when they did their movements on stage, it would just be really powerful and really big and uh, very theatrical. So um, it was a, a fun, quick change for all of them um, because they all have to <laughs> change really quickly from the act two costumes into this. Uh, but by the end, they got it. They were on top of it and they were just, they were just pros by the end. And um, yeah, it was just really wonderful to look at at the end because you could just focus on their voices um, instead of just focusing so much on costume elements. And and remember also, they had the dowels. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. So but what you see in that picture is just this part of the wing, mm -hmm. but they could Perfect. pick up those the dowels. Yeah. And so they were like full wings that wings. went past their arms. It was and super it was cool. very, 
there was like, uh, it's very bird flying kind of song. So it was more like they were going in flight. So I thought that was a fun little addition. Yeah. And remember how the, remember how the ladies were like, we can't do it. Yeah. We can't, no, yeah. we, we can't do it. And, and Melissa and I were like, <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. can. We just need to practice. Yeah, but of course we you practice can. a lot. <laughs> yes. And we're we like, practice oh, a we'll, lot. <laughs> we'll make what we can easier, but we just need to practice. But they were like, can't do it. There's no way. I'm like, yeah. yep, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like that. Whenever it's like a, a really fast, quick change, especially with um, when you're a woman and you're wearing multiple pieces, it's like you just feel dot, like, oh my God, I can't do it. And a lot of the times they fail in the first try because obviously they haven't done it before. And so yeah. as an actor, oh, like you often, have to practice. Yeah. You have to practice and practice, and it's all about a choreographed and cho dance. And choreograph it, yeah, and choreograph the, mm -hmm. the, the quick change, yeah. And, in Miss Bennett, yeah. And that one was not forgivable because it was it was a musical. Yeah. So there was no yeah. there was no faffing that anybody could do. Nobody could say, "Would you like another cup of tea?" Yeah. You know, <laughs> nobody, like nobody was getting saved because it was on the music. But they yeah. did it. I think we had what? I think we had two dressers, and I can't remember yeah. if I, I was there a lot of the times because a lot of the times I like just to be there just to support and just kind of oversee. But um, I know for sure there was two dressers for the really quick quick changes and then the other two were like they figured it out on their own yeah yeah so, they're great and you always ask how many dressers did you use yeah, yeah. dressers are yeah. the MVPs <laughs> yeah they yeah. really really are <laughs> <laughs> Well, other other folks, if you want to ask questions, you feel free to unmute yourself. Feel free to type them in the chat, whatever you want. We're we're opening all up to everyone. So, feel but, free. Um, just a, a a quick change note, just briefly. Um, during Miss Bennett, uh, the the guy that played the main, and again, I can't remember the character's name, but he had to like literally walk off stage, change his coat and his waistcoat, and walk back on stage, and it was like that kind of a it was very fast now that's not changing your whole entire outfit like women have to do most of the time so you know but it it, it was nerve-wracking for him and he had a dresser and we just had to go through it and the actor just has to calm down not try to pick things up off the floor drop the coat drop the vest person will hold it you put it on and then we had it rigged with um magnets so it would just close and a lot of times it's just, yeah, just Melissa, like Melissa's just working with them and you can do it. You can do it. We just yeah. got to do it. Yeah. Calm them down. Calm, Calm them down. down. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. nerves and trying to rush and help in a quick change situation no. is the worst. You won't do it. You'll mess up. You just, yeah, have to give over to it. It's very zen. <laughs> very zen. I mean, by the end of it, the, uh, usually the dresser and the actor usually build up a rapport and a language together so it, it becomes easier as you yeah. do it more but sometimes you can't take the nerves out of the actor so it just kind of depends <laughs> yeah there's a um <clears throat> there's a question here in the chat i think pat was looking at it yeah if someone was interested in costuming how would you recommend they get started education volunteer apprentice assuming they already only had experience co costuming in children's theater etc well that worked out well for pat yeah yeah let's do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah i mean you you can um you can ask if people need help uh, in theaters, um, you can be someone's assistant. That's a really good way to learn. Um, there's things that you have to learn. I think a kind of procedure, Melissa, I think knows that you yeah. need to follow. If you're going to be a costumer, you need to, you know, the, the production meetings, drawings, um, collaboration with the director, finding out, reading the script with, uh, in, in reading it with an intent towards the costumes. Do, is there a blue dress that's mentioned? Does it have to be that kind of yeah. stuff? Um, so being an assistant, trying to be an assistant, you know, at a theater that you like, that you admire is, I can't believe anybody would say no to an assistant, so. Yeah, and for me, um, I, I mean, I had schooling background, but obviously yeah. I, I never made clothing on by hand. And so for me, it was more like, just get my foot in the door doing whatever a theater needs. Yeah. And then obviously, if you have like experience in, in a sense, just be like, hey, I, I also do this in case you ever need that. And honestly, once you get that first little footing, 
if you are a good collaborator, if you get your work done on time, if you figure things out as you go, which is fine. I had to figure things out as I went. I didn't really know like, oh, I have to have drawings. Oh, I have to have this. Like I know I had to read a script and write notes and talk to a director, but there's a lot of things that you learn on the job. And as long as you're on top of that and show that you're invested, it becomes, yeah. you know. And you, and you don't have to be a, you know, an artist to do drawings. You don't even have to actually draw them. There's these things called croquis that you can mm -hmm. get. And I don't know, I mean, I can't, I don't have any on hand, but it's like a little diagram of a, of a person and you can use it uh, underneath the light board, underneath another piece of paper to, to do drawings, or you can just cut things out. You can cut out, if it's a contemporary show, you can look online for things that you think will work and you can make a, you know, a board, like a costume board that way. It doesn't have yeah, to be- Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. Usually for a pull show, it's like, I don't want to give the director that's too hard. much of a, yeah, you don't have, you don't want to say, I want exactly this by doing a drawing. You don't so a lot can... of the times I just pull colors, I pull inspiration, yeah. and then you kind of show them and talk through what you pulled and what you made. And then usually yeah. that's how you get your ideas across too. Sounds good. Christina says mood boards. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. lots of inspiration. Yeah. Okay, Adele wants to know, first off, hi, Ms. Millette. Ah, ha, 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 because Lisa has been teaching a class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question. What was the funniest costume fail that's ever happened? Ooh, good one. <laughs> I don't know. Or near fail. That's what I was thinking, too. Near fail, like it almost, and at the last minute, you fix something with gaff tape or something. Any theater person can jump in too. I'm sure we can. I mean, for me, it's like, uh, it's usually, there's never been fails. It's usually if it's a quick change, sometimes something goes on funny, like it's not lined up properly or it's askew or, you know, an actor forgets to put something on. So those are my fails. Like probably an audience doesn't really see it, doesn't really acknowledge it. But I know like, oh my God, they came out looking like this and they were not supposed to come out looking like this. So those are <laughs> mostly my biggest fails. I remember, I think it was in the Heights, some, uh, I think it was like four of my actors had to leave the stage and come back in these like 1950s clothing. And it was like minuscule seconds. They had to go on and off. And um, sometimes they would look great. And sometimes it would be like a hat like this, yeah. and like a, you know, a jacket oh, like this. I got one. Oh, I got one. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Go. I've got one actually. It was not a fail. It was uh, it was during the photo shoot for um, uh, Frank Frankenstein, and um, I had made these great big what they're called great coats um, for the actor that was playing for a very large actor who was playing Frankenstein, and Kit had directed it. And during the photo shoot, it, they, they're, I don't know if you know what a great coat is. It's a Victorian thing with an it has an over um, cape on it and I had, he had a black one and then he had a white one for the end and the white one um, and they were rigged with uh, magnets the, during the photo shoot he's sitting there in the end and they're taking pictures and I'm looking at him like this and kids look at him like that and we both look at each other and we go he's got his coat on inside out <laughs> He had he had no he had no need had it like once and I think it was the show it was the photo shoot run through and he had just grabbed it in a hurry and you know it was all and put it on and he had it totally inside out so, but we we're sitting there going what what's wrong with that coat oh yeah it's inside out <laughs> at least it wasn't on stage what I had one in, in, during coded because I had a quick change in and out of the um, like the alternate universe of the game where I was the, the other person in the game. Um, you know, nobody saw it, but the video. So, but <laughs> I w had to wear, put a pull on this um, suit that was like a purple iridescent. And I had, to, I pulled it on over the clothes I was wearing as the other character that I was in the show. And I almost went on stage with the shirt from the regular character and the big purple iridescent pants from the gaming the the game game character, character. <laughs> until the person the asm that was helping me get dressed was like the pants the pants <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's always good to have other eyes backstage yes yes yeah. <laughs> like we said dressers are worth their weight in gold oh, as are asms oh here's a big long question bam look at this 
Pat, did you do Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella with Lyric Theater? When Jackie got lifted, I'm reading this out loud because sometimes people don't see the um, chat transcript. Yeah. When Jackie got lifted out of her skirt on stage, her dance partner stepped on her hem when lifting her up. Oh my goodness. And the hooks and the bars at the waist failed. Oh, wow. I was a dresser for that show and had to run to the stage with a handful of big safety pins to put her back into costume. <laughs> so she could go I back. Were you a performance that I was at? <laughs> Actually. Oh, I, that happened when I was not there. <laughs> but were you the costume designer for that show? What's that? Did you design that show? I did. Cinderella. You did. You uh, no, wait, 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 Cinderella? Cinderella? Or Cinderella. Cinderella. God, I don't remember. Not, they may have done it twice. I did one. It was a long time ago. It may not have been the, the one I did. I don't, I don't remember that. <laughs> I probably would have died. Or maybe you blocked it out. <laughs> maybe I blocked it out. Um, either of you have, I also want to ask if either of you have a dream show that you would just love to costume that you haven't done yet. Melissa, it's probably something in the 20s. Um, let me think on that one. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, I'll let Pat go. She's ready. <laughs> um, I have two really goofy. Well, one, unfortunately, is Sunday in the Park with George. Uh, which I was in the middle of um oh that was like oh so that and hopefully it'll still happen but you know um because that just that just makes my little Victorian heart beat fast because it's recreating a painting it's like you know you have to make it look like that uh, anyway and then the other one and it sounds really crazy and it's kind of a throwing back to Gilbert and Sullivan days at Lyric, I would, I would like to do um, Pirates of Penzance in like a really crazy, wacky, you know, over the top way. And then, of course, and I always, I actually always wanted to do um, the Mikado. Unfortunately, I don't know if we're ever gonna be able to do it again, but I wanted to do the Mikado as um, anime, um, Harajuku Girls, make the three little girls from school big, you know, Sailor Moon. <laughs> but uh, I don't think that show is is ever doable again, which it shouldn't be, but yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. Gosh, I see I'm terrible with names. Um, so I think the only one that I can think of the top of my head is One Man, Two Governors, because it's like the only thing I can think that, was, that yeah, I really I just, know. <laughs> and you just did that one. I did that. Uh, I did that, <laughs> that was fun. That was um, fun. And for me, it's like I and hairspray. I think that would be just a fun one. Just hairspray, crazy, yeah, crazy yeah. and wacky. Um, but for me, I do a lot of contemporary plays, and so um, I actually do quite enjoy those because for me, it's I'm really good at uh, secondhand shopping, and I'm really good at putting this together because that's kind of my background with like a lot of my retail background. So for me, I, I like those kind of those kind of shows because a lot of times it's like focus on the actor the clothes you just kind of like enhance the character but not deter from it so but yeah one man two governors and uh definitely first place and answer i already did that. much i was gonna say i already did my 1920s like uh show uh over at uh silicon valley shakespeare we did much ado about nothing and set it in 1920s and that was my nice. like, 1920s dream <laughs> nice and Anne suggests the early modern millie that might be a good one for you oh too. yeah that one Duh. yeah yeah <laughs> Musicals, big musicals like that are yeah. a whole different animal. Oh my God, so hard. They are, and they're not easy. And I don't, I, I'm lucky enough not to have messed up any of the ones that I've done because it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> lot I, of work. For, cap, for Cabaret, I was, I was lucky enough to get an intern to help me because it's yeah. just such a massive beast. So musicals are not for the faint of heart. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to pay a compliment to both of these costume designers. Um, you can tell I love working with them. I'm always, you know, I'll, I, I just alternate or then ask them both <laughs> to be on one show. Um, and what's fun about that is the styles are so different, but you still, you compliment each other so beautifully. But my compliment, it comes from my um, experience as a director. And um, 
you both have a way, whether it's a period piece or a contemporary piece, of making the clothes on the actors look like their clothing, not mm. look like costumes. And that is huge. You, oh, especially you. in all in the ones, I mean, Lizzie and Elephant Man, I mean, especially clothes that we don't wear every day to make it look like that's what they wear. And, that, and the reason why I think one of the reasons why you're so good at this, both of you, is that you both said they need to feel comfortable. The actors need to feel um, empowered to be their best character. And mm -hmm. so by taking the, the actor's feelings and body types into consideration, I think it makes it more possible to have the actors look like they're wearing their clothes no matter what year it is. Even if it is 20 years from now, thank you, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it does, they don't look like costumes. And that, oh. that's a big thing for me. I don't like it when they look like costumes, unless they're supposed to look like costumes. So well, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> thank Compliment. You. Thank you. <laughs> I can't wait until we can do plays again together, ladies. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Uh, Soon. Uh, you, you know, you never think, you, uh, you always think contemporary is, doesn't get the recognition either, but um, I felt really good after, um, oh God, B Build, was that it? Build? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah because somebody at one of the receptions came up and said they could see his transition, the transitions between the two men in their clothing, even though it was like, it was not screaming, but it was subtle. And I went, oh, thank you. Cause you, you think you do, sometimes you think you're doing this kind of thing in a vacuum, you know, that even though it's contemporary, it's not just clothes, there's, there's a reason and there's a design. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Gosh, I directed that one too. I really you did. Glad I did. You guys. I did. <laughs> and I only yeah. direct one a year out of six, usually. <laughs> well, isn't Bill the one where one of the actors, Max, and Max's mother, come up to you and say, "Could you please that dress him real. all the time?" That was real. I got him this gray Italian cut suit. That was not very expensive, but man, he looked good in it. He but did. Max, Max, uh, you know, you can hand him just about anything. True. <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> He's a clothes horse. He really yeah, that's Max Tack as some from, uh, probably many of you are familiar with him. And and costuming him in and Merchant was so much fun because he had that bright blue suit on. And then you can always tell when you say, here, try this on. It was like a plaid jacket. And he was like, oh, oh, yeah. He gets very excited. I buy this <laughs> after the show. And then he did buy it after the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah he was in two of the shows that we just had up uh elephant man and jekyll not lizzie of course but. yeah <laughs> does anyone else have questions oh go ahead pat I say, speaking of using costumes again man those those coats that you bought melissa for jekyll and hyde that was great those are great because we i've used them a million times in the victorian the men's um uh what do you call it frock coats yeah uh, yeah those were great so. It's kind of funny, like uh, when whenever it's like you think of purchasing things, which I'd like not to do because a lot of the times it's budgets and space. You don't want to, you know, encumber a, a company and be like, not put away all this stuff that I bought you. Yeah. But with those, it's like, a, you know, I, I bought four different sizes, very good sizes that so like, useful. fit many different actors. And so it's kind of a benefit because then they don't have to spend money again. Yep. Very useful. I like it. There's another question here in the chat from Jill. Jill wants to know who are costume designers you admire or movies, shows, or TV shows that you think do a great job? Mad Men. Okay. <laughs> I love Colleen Atwood. She's uh, one of my favorite designers just because it's fantasy, but it's also, it's just a, a really beautiful visual, just um, visual wonderment whenever you see a show from her because you know her style, I feel like. Um, and it's always just fun to see costume design that I can never really do, which is usually like very um, out of the box and very, very um, avant-garde. And for me, that's not my strong suit. So I get inspired a lot by seeing designers like that on stage because, or uh, in film because it's something I, I want to be, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I'm terrible at names and I cannot remember the woman's name. She did, um, she did the Disney live action Cinderella with um oh god it was the the design was somewhere between it was all over the place but between like 
it was like, all I can say it was like 1940s Victorian, you know, it was, it was incredible and the colors were so great. And I wish I could remember her name, but I'll look it up on IMDb. <laughs> I'll do that right now. Um, yeah. And then, and then something that I've always wanted to do is paint on, do painting on costumes. So make the costumes. Sandy either. Powell. That hmm? might be it. Sandy Powell. Is that yes. Name? Yes. That's it. Yes. Somebody yep. said in the chat. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah um, I like her too. And like in the in the new, actually the new uh, Mary Poppins, the some of the costumes were in the in the cartoony sequences were actual. I saw them at Fitum when we went down there for a show, and the um, they're painted on the like the skirt ruffles are painted on the skirt. They're not, but they're painted so they look like they're three D ruffles. Um, it's very cool. So. Yeah, I was right. going to do some, I was going to do some painting on costumes for Sunday in the park because I thought it would be perfect, but. <laughs> oh, oh, Sunday in the park, that's just going to be a sore spot for you for a long time. It is, it is. Uh, I mean, we all have the show that had to close during the pandemic. Yeah. Or before. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Hardly, un hardly unique. Uh, but Melissa, you've costumed in the pandemic. You're a pandemic costumer. Yes, <laughs> and it's, it's, um, it's, it's challenging, <laughs> to say the least. How did you um, do it, that? Oh my gosh. It was hard. I mean, uh, a lot of the times we have to do all the safety protocols and obviously it can't really touch the actors too much, which makes it really hard with fittings. But luckily the two shows that I did during um, quarantine and pandemic um, were ones that I didn't really have to get that close. Like they were Grecian type dresses, which was really easy to fit for the most part um, and contemporary uh, with what I, I could just get basic measurements from actors and I could just kind of, especially since they were actors that I had worked with, it was easier to shop. But for me, it's it's not easy if you're doing a big musical because you can't. And it's not easy if you're doing yeah. anything Victorian or, or a period because you can't really get in there and Fit. take measurements if you're making anything. And if yeah. you're, you know, obviously fitting from something already made, it's hard to fit it to an actor because you, you can't get, I can't do it with gloves. <laughs> it's really hard. So uh, yeah, it's, it's challenging. I think you can only do small shows and contemporary shows, unfortunately. At didn't you do, um, didn't you do an act of God at Palo de Players? Wasn't that you? I did. I did. Yeah. And that one was uh, interesting. I had a friend of mine helping me make the wings and we had a shield, mask, gloves, and it was more like, okay, I'm going to do this on you and just kind of chalk it. And it was, you know, we did mm -hmm. our best to maintain six feet. And when we couldn't, we just made sure we were just covered head to toe if we could so that we were safe. Yeah. Yeah. Big challenge. Definitely. Well, as always, we... We can't wait for the day when we're all back doing this in real time again. Before we wrap up, does anyone have any other questions for Pat or Melissa? I thought I heard a microphone turn on. <laughs> all righty. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure, thank pleasure. You. Um, yeah. Next week, the next stage is going to be dark because we are turning everyone's attention to our podcast channel. City Lights podcast channel is Filament, and we are going to have a series every other day, all Halloween week. There are going to be new shows with spooky stories, original stories and poems from our community and different people from the City Lights family reading them. I'm actually one of the guest readers, which I'm really excited about. And then we'll be back November 6th with a Calendar Girls reunion. Calendar Girls was our 2016 holiday show. Pat was in that. Um, that's right. So you didn't costume it. Who costumed it? <laughs> uh, uh, Christine? No. Who was, what's her name? I can't remember now. That's funny. Chris, Christine Ormsmith? Was it Christine Ormsmith? Did she do costuming or just I makeup? Remember. I can't remember. Uh, Anyway, anyway, Calendar Girls was was a terrific uh, comedy show based on the, the Miramax film uh, in 2016. And so it was about women of a certain age who are raising money for the local hospital by posing for a tastefully nude calendar. Although Pat <laughs> kept her clothes on in that show. I kept my clothes on. <laughs> so we hope you'll join us back here. That one will be on Zoom as well. All the information's on the website, cltc.org slash the next stage.
Anna Chase. Thank you, Miranda. That's yes, Anna Chase did the costume for Miranda. Calendar Girls. Anna Miranda, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes, thank yes, thank you. And as we wrap up, Kathleen has one more question. What's your next show? Do either of you have any other shows in the pipeline, virtual or otherwise, that we can see? Yeah, I know. Oh, no. <laughs> it's hard. Oh, um, yeah. The both things that I had were at Los Altos, and I was in one. I was in um, Steel Magnolias, and supposed to costume Sunday in the Park, and both of them. I don't even know when they're happening. I don't think till yeah. twenty two. So yeah. I think I, I was supposed to do. I think Paul also players um, a, a Twelfth Night. I think and uh, Silicon Valley Shakespeare I was supposed to do Romeo and Juliet, but that's supposed to be next year, next summer. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Probably. Fingers crossed. Oh, I hate ending on this sad note. Let's end on a happy <laughs> note. Let's just say thank you for your wonderful creation. So inspiring. Thank you for that golden dress. And the beautiful pop hat. Love you. Love you very much. Uh, thank you. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. Uh, <laughs> everyone have a wonderful night and stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Bye.